Hello and welcome back to the Mortgage Mum podcast with me, Gemma Bennett, your guest host for today. And I am very pleased to be back and talking to you all. Now, have you ever wondered how different employment contracts affect your chances of getting a mortgage? Well, if you haven't, maybe you'll learn something today. And if you have, and you're wondering what your kind of contract um, means in the mortgage market and, and how to go about getting your own, your best chances for a mortgage, let me talk to you about this. So m majority of people that are employed are on a permanent contract. And that means that they have set hours, um, a set um, um, uh, salary. Um, and these these conditions are, you know, this maybe the standard conditions. And for those kinds of permanent contracts, we tend to ask for three months pay slips. And perhaps if there's annual bonuses or commission, we will ask for a few more. We might ask for some P60s. Um, sometimes there's people that haven't even started their job yet, but have been offered a permanent contract. And we can look at getting them a mortgage based on the contract and the future start date if it's within three months. However, that isn't the same for those people that are on fixed term contracts, temporary contracts, or zero hour contracts. Now, if you've never had one of these, you might not have even thought to ask or thought to think of it as different. But if you are actually on one of these, perhaps the thought has gone through your mind, um, how does this affect things? Now, you are absolutely employed. You have a certain amount of salary, perhaps, that you've agreed, or you know how much is coming in because you know how much work you do. However, it, the lenders will view these sorts of contracts differently. Now, if you've listened to any of these podcasts before, which I hope you have, and if you haven't, please go back. There's a plethora of information on these. If you, Then you'll know how varied the lenders actually are. And this is something that was huge news to me when I first joined this um, industry. It was just how varied they are and just how um, innovative and creative they can be. So when I talk to you about these temporary contracts, what I'm going to do is talk to you about the mainstream and the majority. And I want to caveat that with the, the, the knowledge that there is also bespoke or various uh, lenders that might take a view on your situation. So if you don't quite tick the boxes that I'm going to describe to you, it's still worth reaching out and having a conversation because in certain cases, um, there are exceptions to these or there are lenders that can become exceptions to these. So please always reach out and get advice for your personal circumstances. So I'm going to start with temporary Temporary, I'm going to, uh, hold on. So I'm going to start by looking at temporary contracts or we'll call them temp contracts. So this is a contract where you're not permanent. You are temporarily in a role. Um, you are, no, I'm not gonna do that. Okay, so I'm going to take a look at fixed term contracts. So these contracts might be that you've been employed by an employer for a year, or perhaps if you're working in education, for example, you've been employed for the educational year all the way up to September. Um, now, as you can imagine from a mortgage lender, I always say they are looking for security. They want to lend to you, providing they can be sure that you're gonna be able to meet the payments. So to them, if a contract has an end date to it, September, for example, that's when uh, you might start, and July, if you're in education, for example, you might stop. They need to know that there's going to be work to continue. Now, the way that they do this, on the most part, is actually by looking backwards. So what they will look for is a year to two years. Now, most lenders would like to see two years of a similar type of employment. Now that doesn't mean it has to be with the exact same employer, because perhaps you are on fixed term contracts in various different places in a similar sector. So the lender will first 
feel the most comfort if you have a history of this. Like I said, a minimum of a year tends to work for a lot of lenders. Two years is even better. So how do we prove this? We prove it with P60s, mostly. Um, we prove it with keeping the contracts that you've had over the last couple of years, making sure they're filed away somewhere so we can prove them and bring them out and show that you've continuously had work throughout the last few years. If you have been working in this way for perhaps a year and there's only a few more months left on your current contract, that will make the lender a little bit wobbly as well. So what we're actually looking for is six months or more left on your contract or failing that, most lenders would appreciate or need um, your employer to confirm, perhaps in an employer's letter, um, that they are going to renew your contract or that they intend to do that and they'd have that on headed paper. Or perhaps you've got a new contract that's starting after. They won't want to see long gaps in unemployment. So if your contract ends in July, they won't want to see that your new contract starts in January, for example. But they could understand that your new contract might start in September, especially if you're working in education. That makes complete sense. So the key with this is, no, it isn't as simple as a permanent contract, because a permanent contract doesn't ask these questions and has a a more of a sense of security for the lender and your income going forwards. But the key to this is paper trail and proof and a history in working in that way. So what happens if you have been working in a certain field, employed permanent, and then you decide that you want to change the way you're working and become a temporary contractor in that field, for example? Now there are exceptions where the lender can see that you have been working in the same field for a number of years in an employed position, and now you're going to a temporary relationship, perhaps working via an agency. And the reason being, sometimes, although it adds more risk, it potentially adds more money. There are certain situations where working via an agency will actually increase your hourly pay and your ability to bring in income. So you can completely understand why people might want to do this. If the case is that you're actually working in the same field that you've been working in for a number of years and you've just changed the type of employment that you're doing, there are some lenders and not all that will take a view on this and actually understand the process here enough to take a view and say, right, we will take you know, the income that's coming in now, or perhaps they'll average it out based on your last P60 and what you're doing now, but they won't require those years um, behind you, those two years behind you of working in exactly the same way. This wouldn't be every lender, but there are some that have said that in this, if you're working in the same industry and you can prove that, and again, it comes down to proof, the more we can prove. I've had clients recently who are on something called renewable contracts, which means that basically for the last four years, every term gets a new contract. So a term is only sort of three months, isn't it? And they had a little bit of a problem with paperwork because the employer was quite happy to keep renewing their contract, but they weren't very quick at getting those contracts to her. So by the time we had started to look at our options, she'd already started the new contract. And by the time I got the paperwork for that, the contract was coming to an end. Now, thankfully in this case, she had enough of a history of it and we could get a letter to confirm that this was the case, that we managed to find our way forward. But what I would say is if you are somebody that works with different contracts quite regularly, even every year or six months, please, please, please be really diligent with the paperwork. Make sure the employers are getting that to you in good time because as and when it's time for your mortgage, you're gonna to need to prove it. Also your P60s, your P60s from various employments, if that's the case, keep them all because they are what we're gonna to want to see. They're what the lender's going to want to see to understand your actual annual income. It might be if you're on a zero hour contract, for example, that the last three months you've been earning more than what you actually would normally earn over a year. And so the lender will understand that that could be the case. And although they will look at the latest three months, they will also look at the last P60 and potentially the year before to be able to get a proper understanding of your income level.
So a zero hours contract, I just mentioned it very briefly there and threw it in, but I'm going to come back to that. So a zero hours contract means you're contracted and you work for an employer, but they are not contracted to give you any hours at all. And this is relatively common in some NHS roles um, and agency work and things like that. So uh, some lenders will only accept zero hours contract if it's in the NHS because they understand that that's how that nature of work goes. Um, and it might be something like bank nursing and agency work and things like that. But there are other lenders that will consider a zero hour contract and in any um, capacity. So a zero hours contract, again, they're going to want some proof. They want to know how many hours on average you are working. Now, this could be looked at over six months. Some will even look at it over a year. Um, they will also take at your last three months and potentially average that to get an idea. The lenders are all varied in their approaches. There is one lender who will look at the last three months and that will be the annual um, amount. Other lenders will take a longer look and they'll want to see. But once again, a history in it is important. So over 12 months working in this way, two years is even better, um, will give them that comfort and will enable them to be able to really get a view of your affordability. And I come back to what I always say when it comes to self-employment, where I did a podcast on self-employment. The lender wants to lend. They want to feel secure in the position. And it can feel very, very hard when you're being asked numerous questions and you're having to give a lot more documents and potentially some historic stuff and they're questioning this. The only reason they're doing that, and I've learned this, having been on either side, been the client that's thinking, why are you asking me all these questions? Don't you like me? Um, to now being the broker that understands where the questions are coming from and what the lender's doing. So they are asking all these questions because they want to feel secure. They want to understand and they want to, they want to understand and they want to know that after your contract, are you going to be able to pay this mortgage? Which makes sense. It's responsible lending at the end of the day. And the likelihood is, of course you are, because you wouldn't have put yourself forward for having a mortgage if you didn't know that there was going to be work after this contract. So all they want to understand is how do you know that? Can you prove it? Have you had a history in it? And these things are going to make a big difference to what they're able to lend you. So do be aware that although lenders affordability and their criteria around how they view the actual amount that they can lend you, vary so much that I wouldn't be able to cover it all in this, that if your last couple of P60s and your latest um, pay slips vary a lot, one is considerably maybe higher than the other, that the lender might want to take an average because they might think well, you're in a particularly high paid temporary role at the moment if you're on a temporary contract, but that hasn't been the history over the last three years. So perhaps they'd like to hedge their bets a little bit like they do with self-employed people where they tend to take two years and average it out. If they're fairly similar and they can really see that those levels are, are, are very similar, it's quite possible that they'll look at the latest three months or six months and, and work from that. Um, so the key take homes, excuse me. So the key take homes here are to be organized with your paperwork, to be able to prove in every way you possibly can that you have had a history working in this way, whether it be a temporary contract, a fixed term contract, or a zero hours contract. And if you can offer any support to show that you've got work going forwards or you've got quite a long time left on your contract, this will all help to be able to prove to the lender that you are able to pay your mortgage going forward and that the levels that you've offered them for your affordability are backed up with evidence. Now, when it comes to paperwork and contracts, one of the key things we want to see is that it's signed. So the employer must really make sure that both parties have, have 
So with the paperwork, we do want to see that it's been signed by yourself and the employer. So don't let the employers or anybody get a bit lazy with the paperwork. Make sure it's in a file with you, preferably before you've even started, and it's signed because then it's good. Otherwise, the, the lender will want to send it back and say this hasn't been signed. So it's important to get those things and any um, confirmation from a, an employer that you can um, offer on a headed paper will also go to support your case. Now, this leads me on to working with a broker, which I know is very obvious that myself as a senior broker at the Mortgage Mum would say, but I mean it because in these situations, I can't in this, if I could give you absolutely every bit of information in this podcast, I would, but I've had to be relatively generalized. And the reason for that is because the lenders are so different. And if I said all lenders need this, there'd be a handful that say, no, we don't. That's not true. <laughs> so my point is that the variations in the market are so complex and such a puzzle. No, don't say that. The variations in the market are so wide and, <laughs> well, okay, that there are so many variations in the market that really you do need to get some advice. You do need to speak to a broker so that they can put the puzzle together. And in all honesty, that's the fun bit for the broker. It's working out your position, how the lenders are going to view it, how to position it best and which lender to go to and why. And if you're not sure how your current situation looks, but you're not ready to remortgage or purchase a property or move home at this point, why not speak to a broker before, before you're at that stage? Because the broker can then advise you on what it currently looks like, what you need going forward. And you might go, right, that's fine. I could prove that. Good. When the time's right, I'll be ready. And actually, if you're not, you've got a forward plan. You know what needs to happen in order to secure that mortgage offer, that all important mortgage offer. I always encourage people to speak to a broker before you're ready and when you're ready, because that way everybody's on the same page and you've been given sound advice. Because when we look for this advice ourselves, it's easy to get roped into maybe out of date advice or a rabbit hole or one person's experience but what you don't realize maybe is that that one person has a very different case to you and so it's definitely worth getting advice now most mortgage brokers I know here at the mortgage mum you can contact us and have advice without paying anything at that stage now we do charge a broker fee on most cases and that will be all the way down the line at application and you can talk to us about what that is and how that looks but to have the advice at the beginning stages to do some research and to check out your you know eligibility and affordability you literally just need to contact us whether it's by email or phone and I can't speak for every broker um, but I know there'll be other firms as well that will be able to offer similar service or the same service there so please 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 do check out your contracts. If you don't know, and until you've listened to this, con um, this well, if you don't know what kind of contract you're on, until you listen to this and thought, well, hang on, what am I on? Do check that out as well, because it might be a question you haven't asked yet. Um, so find out what contract you're on. Are you permanent? Are you zero hours? Are you temporary? Have Are you on a fixed rate? Not, a, no. Are you on a fixed term? I really hope that that has given you some insight. I hope it's enabled you to prepare and recognize what the lenders are looking for if your employment contract is not a permanent one. And there are other ways that people can be employed. We've got IT contractors, we've got CIS contractors that work in the um, construction industry and various other ways. I've basically covered today fixed term zero hours and temporary contracts as best I can. But if you've got any other questions, please don't hesitate to ask us and we will find out the answers for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.